On this channel, we talk about all things peptides, and there's been a big shift in the peptide space as far as regulation and accessibility of a lot of these peptides. So we're going to talk all about that today. And really what we're going to cover in this video is what the change is, what does this mean for the clinical prescribing community, doctors, nurse practitioners that use peptides in their practice, and then how does this affect the entire industry, all of the research chemical peptides that are available online, and ultimately the end user, you. How does this impact you as far as peptide access? So let's get started. Now, what happened is that the FT actually changed the category of these peptides. So just to be clear, these peptides are not banned from use. They've just changed into a category two, which is, means that the FDA deems these peptides is not very safe. Here's some of the report that the FDA put out. And this really affects 503A and 503B compounding pharmacies. So it prevents the compounding pharmacies from actually producing a lot of these peptides. The peptides listed are the ones that are affected. So AOD 9604, which previously was actually recommended. You can see the summary of the safety risks here. And AOD 9604 is one of the peptides that was impacted. This peptide actually previously had grass status, meaning generally recognized as safe. So it's really strange that they would now say this is banned as it was previously deemed one of the safer peptides. BPC-157, L037, which I like using for candida. It's highly uh, effective against candida overgrowth. That's another one that's affected. CJC-1295, dihexa. A lot of these peptides that I use and know and have had a lot of benefits with patients in utilizing these. DSIP, epitalon, you can see copper peptides as well. And this is for injectable root. All of these are going to change in terms of the compounding pharmacies being able to compound them for injectable and likely uh, some of the nasal sprays as well. So as you can see, looking through this list, there's so many of these peptides that will no longer be produced by compounding pharmacies like KPV, melanotan 2 kispeptin. There are a few peptides that were not affected, and that is your GLP-1 agonist. So things like semaglutide, terazepatide, those peptides that really work on appetite suppression will not be affected. They're not on this list, as you can see, but many of the other really effective peptides are going to be affected. So what does this mean for the clinical prescribing community? Well, essentially, your practitioners will no longer be able to recommend or prescribe these through a compounding pharmacy. It doesn't mean that we can't educate and, and discuss how to use these with patients or with the general public. It just means that there won't be a prescription option available. Really, what's going to happen, what I see happening is a lot of these online vendors of peptides that will deem the vials of peptides as research chemicals will probably grow in number. And the argument here that a lot of practitioners make, and I also have made, is the quality of peptides between a compounding pharmacy and an online vendor, that it's very different, right? And this is a research chemical on a vial of peptides, is that there's really no legal grounds to go after these online manufacturers or cause them to discontinue production because of that label. And so the compounding pharmacies are being hit hard. They're going to lose, obviously, a lot of revenue as well as not be able to provide doctors with the opportunity to prescribe these peptides. But online, these peptides are still going to be available. So really finding a reputable source is going to be key. I'm actually going to be one of the writers for a website called peptides.org which is really going to be like the healthline.com of peptides. And they're producing a lot of content that's written by doctors, really backed in research. And I'll be a part of their website, being able to educate, still educate and still provide resources on peptides, but just not able to prescribe them in the same way through a compounding pharmacy. There could be pros to this, right? So for many people, this may open up the opportunity to use these peptides. I always like to say that if you're not familiar with peptides, it's really key to work with a practitioner or at least learn what you're doing before you 
inject anything into your body or start utilizing these, but it may open up the opportunity for so many people who haven't had access either to a practitioner within their state who can prescribe them or compounding pharmacy or just the financial means to purchase these peptides through compounding pharmacies, which tend to be a little bit more expensive because of the testing and the quality. It may open up access to more people, right? So less relying on a practitioner for accessing these, but able to educate themselves. So really we answered that second question of how will this affect the research chemical peptide industry? So a lot of those online manufacturers, and essentially it's probably going to cause some growth in this sector, right? So for peptides.org, they do sell peptides. There's lots of online websites who sell peptides and Many of your practitioners are going to have to also refer to these sources if they're unable to get compounded options through a compounding pharmacy. Just to be clear, this does not ban the peptides. They're still available for use. There's no law and ordinance that has been placed that says you cannot buy, purchase, use peptide therapy or any of these peptides in the United States. You can still use these. They're just not going to be available through a compounding pharmacy. And to comment on the FDA's ruling on this as a practitioner, they reported some potential safety risks concerning the immunogenicity linked to specific peptides. They're worried about safety issues, which is understandable, but there's a lot of other drugs that they're able to profit off of that are not banned. Things like semaglutide, tesamorelin was not banned, and terazepatide, as I mentioned. And so this is really the hand of big pharma Inevitably, what will probably happen is that Big Pharma will take many of these peptides that they recategorized to a category two, and they will turn them into pharmaceutical drugs down the road because they realize this is a profitable industry. We'll have to do a lot of safety testing. But really, in my experience, the, the peptides, when used as directed, really have a lower side effect profile, and many people respond very well. So it's concerning is in the sense that the FDA would rule this to remove access to these healthy, more preventative options. And that would leave in the situation of COVID, that would leave, you know, only the pharmaceutical options as an available thing, and then uh, remove things like thymosin alpha-1, thymulin, these peptides that support immune function from access to the general public or prescribing doctors to offer that. So what does this mean going forward? Well, in the next 30 to 60 days, many of the compounding pharmacies will discontinue their production and they will sell out of the supply that they currently have. So now would be a good time to order those peptides or look into sourcing those before that access through a compounding pharmacies disappears. Certain compounding pharmacies will have some peptides that they're still able to produce like PT-141, Sermorelin, NAD, which is injected like a peptide, or gonadarelin. So those will likely still be available. Many of the common peptides like BPC, CJC, Ipermorelin will no longer be available after that point. So needless to say, now is really the time to stock up while you can. And if you can get those powdered vials that you can add bacteriostatic water to, those tend to stay good. Their beyond use date is quite long. And it really depends on the peptide, but a lot of times the beyond use date, if you have a powder vial, could be up to a year, many times over six months. For example, like BPC tends to be at least six months. Hypermorelin CJC tends to be a BUD or beyond use date of about a year if it's powder form, and then you mix it when you're ready to use it. So there's also uh, room for being able to hold on to these and, and then use them, mix them with bacteriostatic when you're ready to inject or use that peptide. There is a petition where you can sign to save the peptides for practitioners. I'm going to put that link below. So if you're a practitioner, if you're a patient, if you're somebody who's interested in peptides, go sign that. If you would love to keep access for practitioners to be able to prescribe. In the meantime, I'll be contributing to peptides.org as one of their contributing writers and content developers for video content. And so you can also find out more information there about peptides. There's a lot of research-backed articles on peptides, dosing, all of the all the things. And of course, none of this is medical information. I am a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. But I hope this was educational, informational for you. And 
understanding what this ruling from the FDA really means for peptides, that there will still be access, uh, but not through compounding pharmacies. And if you enjoyed this video, you found it helpful for understanding the current climate in the peptide space, definitely give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Share this with somebody, a practitioner, somebody you know that maybe doesn't know that peptides classification is changing. So grateful that you're following along with the channel and all of the developments in the peptide space. Definitely stay tuned for our next weekly video. If there's any questions about this, please put them in the comments. If you have any other topics within the peptide, the wellness, anti-aging, biohacking, nootropic space, definitely put them below. Happy to make a video in response to your, your questions. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Peptide Doc, and I'll see you on the next video. If you enjoyed this video, you might also like to listen to this one that dives a little bit deeper into how to use these peptides.